Another American Marine is killed in Beirut. As the Druze leader, Wally Jumblatt, warns there's more terrible fighting to come. Mr. Tony Benn makes the Chesterfield by-election shortlist after all. And in the FA Cup, 4th Division Bristol City are still in with a giant killing chance. Good evening. Another American Marine was killed in Beirut today as new diplomatic moves began to secure peace in Lebanon and to get the multinational peacekeeping forces out. The Foreign Secretary, Sir Geoffrey Howe, met the Egyptian Foreign Minister in Cairo and will go on to Saudi Arabia and Syria. And the Syrian, Saudi and Lebanese Foreign Ministers have met in Riyadh. But the Lebanese Druze Muslim leader, Mr. Wally Jumblatt in Damascus, says he sees no chance of peace in Lebanon. He warned of further terrible fighting in the near future. The American killed today was hit when unknown guerrillas attacked two marine helicopters on the ground about half a mile from the embassy compound now shared by Britain and the United States. He was the 250th American killed in Lebanon since the Marines were sent in 16 months ago. This from Brent Sadler. The Marines had just left one of these giant transport helicopters when they came under fire. Following previous attacks on American forces, this method of transport is now reckoned to be the safest. The Marine died after being hit by a rocket-propelled grenade during the attack which lasted only three minutes. With the military situation still tense in and around Beirut, Lebanese intelligence sources are aware that the shooting will only make matters worse. The killing comes at a time when the Lebanese government is struggling to reach agreement with the warring factions over a new security plan which could end the fighting. The death of yet another Marine in a well-planned attack will not make the peace negotiations any easier. They came under intense small arms fire, machine gun fire, and rocket propelled grenade fire. Helicopter gun crews, as well as Marines in the area, returned fire. As Lebanese government forces try to identify the gunmen, the Americans are now likely to further consider what other steps they can take to protect their troops and diplomats in Lebanon. Brent Sadler, ITN, Beirut. On his Middle East visits, Sir Geoffrey Howe will discuss the Lebanon with political leaders in Egypt before going on to Syria and Saudi Arabia. Before flying out, he said the British and other peacekeeping troops will be high on his agenda. Thank you. Will you be floating the idea of a UN force in Beirut as opposed to the multinational? That's one of the topics, obviously, that uh, is under discussion in some places now, and I shall be discussing that uh, if the opportunity arises. The Saudi, Syrian and Lebanese foreign ministers talked for more than three hours in Riyadh today about the sticking points which have so far stopped a Saudi-inspired peace plan for Lebanon being accepted. The plan would give President Jamal's army control of some areas now held by Christian or Muslim militias. The Druze leader, Mr. Jumblatt, in the Syrian capital, claimed President Jamal and his Christian phalangist allies won't accept it because he said they didn't want peace. They have other intentions. They are strengthening their army, getting more arms, more supplies, and I'm expecting further fighting, further violent fighting, terrible fighting in the near future. They want to control certain areas in West Beirut, Shiite areas, and in the mountain, basically the Druze areas. They want to control these areas by force. I mean, Jemael will not accept any challenge to his so-called authority any opposition to his authority, be it Walid Jumblat or Nabi Burri or Karami or Fanji. Mr. Jumblat, do you hold out any hope for any agreement anytime soon? I have to hope, but I'm a little bit skeptical about achieving any solution with the Jemayel administration. So what happens now? War again, somebody is to lose, somebody is to win, we'll see. Back at home, Mr. Tony Benn has, after all, been added to the shortlist of Labour candidates for the Chesterfield by-election. He says he's very proud. Mr. Benn was put on the list this afternoon by the local Labour committee. They overturned yesterday's surprise decision by the local executive to exclude him. 116 members of the Chesterfield Labour Management Committee turned up today to review the executive's shortlist of five. At a news conference afterwards, it was revealed that over half voted to amend it and add Mr. Ben's name. The decision may have been swayed by the miners who had more than 20 delegates present. It didn't surprise me or not surprise me. He could have said, did it surprise me that Paul Warman had it or that um, 
Someone else wasn't added. No, he just went through the proper procedure and his name wasn't added on Friday. It's been added today and that's the proper procedure of the Labour Party. So a total of six names go forward to next Sunday's meeting of the management committee when the candidate will be chosen. Mr Ben, with the leading number of nominations, must remain a front runner. But there is a feeling in Chesterfield that a local candidate should go forward and with four such names to choose from, that must remain a possibility. Michael McMillan, ITN, Chesterfield. A visit to the United States by the Chinese Prime Minister has started a battle of words between China and the Russians about a threat of nuclear war. As Premier Zhao Zhang set foot in American soil in Hawaii, the Chinese People's Daily commented, no sooner had the United States started to position its Pershing and cruise missiles than the Soviet Union announced it would place more new missiles in Eastern Europe. Last week, the Soviet paper Red Star accused China of swallowing Western propaganda wholesale in mistakenly seeing Soviet missiles in Asia as a threat. Here's an American report on the Chinese Premier's visit to the United States. The Chinese Premier, Zhao Ziyang, arrived to a traditional Hawaiian welcome. It's the first time since 1979 that the U.S. has received a top-ranked Chinese leader. Zhao ranks fourth in the Communist Party, and at 64 is seen as leader of a new generation of influential technocrats. The Premier embarked at once on a round of sightseeing in Honolulu, the USS Arizona at Pearl Harbor, where he dropped a ceremonial lay, and later the Polynesian Cultural Center. Zhao makes this American journey, he says, to improve U.S.-China ties, which have suffered a number of setbacks in the past few years. The Chinese have often voiced their unhappiness with President Reagan's sympathies for the nationalists on Taiwan and oppose U.S. arms sales to the nationalist island. After this stop in Hawaii, Zhao moves on from Polynesian dances to a tour of colonial Williamsburg, Virginia, all before sitting down with President Reagan in Washington on Tuesday. Jim Laurie, ABC News. A top naval commander has warned that NATO hasn't got the warships to effectively fight a major war. Admiral Sir William Staveley, one of NATO's top three commanders, says he hopes politicians will be able to stomach the decisions which NATO would have to take in a war. Admiral Staveley says he has only half the number of frigates and destroyers needed to guard convoys because NATO countries are cutting back their fleets or sending them to distant destinations like the Falklands. In war, they need to protect convoys carrying tanks, guns and ammunition from the United States to Western Europe. On mine layers, he says, the position's even worse, with only enough to cover the very basic, absolutely minimum essentials. They're now concentrated only on protecting the Holy Lock and Faslane nuclear submarine bases in Scotland and the ports which convoy would use in, an, in the event of a war. Admiral Staveley, in an interview with Jane's Defence Weekly, also warns that while the West's cutting back, the Russians are building what he calls very upmarket replacements for their fleet. Eleven Red Cross workers in Uganda are reported to have been abducted by guerrillas. They were last seen being led by four armed men into the bush about 40 miles west of Kampala. British Red Cross workers have been working in the area, but it's not known whether any Britons were among those kidnapped. The South Africans say they have begun withdrawing their forces from southern Angola following the battle in which they say their troops killed more than 300 guerrilla fighters. They say their offensive from Namibia into Angola has successfully disrupted SWAPO operations and more than a thousand guerrillas have fled north. For the second day running, rebel miners who are defying their union's overtime ban have been turned back by pickets at Staffordshire Pits. Nine men failed to get into work today. 43 winders who control the lift cages say they'll stage a 24-hour strike tomorrow in protest of the union's overtime ban. It'll mean 8,000 Staffordshire miners idle tomorrow. A rugby league match between Oldham and Lee was stopped by the referee today when players started fighting on the pitch. It happened after two players were sent off for swinging punches. Both sets of forwards started brawling in the scrum and a policeman had to come on to separate the two teams. Lee had been leading by 26 points to 14 when the game was stopped in the second half. Soccer and the fourth division club Bristol City are still in with a chance in the FA Cup. They held first division Notts County to a two-all draw in the third round today. They'll play again on Tuesday. Cup football on Sunday was just the ticket for the worst supported club in Division 1. Well, for three minutes anyway, and then Bristol took a shock lead through Crawford. Sometimes mud tastes wonderful. 
Inspired, no doubt, by Bournemouth's antics, the fourth division side came within a splinter's width of making it 2-0. Pritchard, the unlucky one. Knotts desperately needed a breather, and they got it with a fortunate penalty. Did Harcourt slip, or was he pushed? At any rate, Christie wasn't about to argue. For a time, County began to lord it. Chidozi was in devilish mood. Harcourt got the touch, and Christie was there again. Now would Bristol lie down and surrender? Not likely, though their equaliser was, to say the very least, controversial. McDonough in goal seemed to have the ball, got a kick on the head, and while not stopped play, Ritchie saw his chance. County couldn't believe it. McDonough, who needed five stitches in his head, probably won't remember it, but his manager, Jimmy Cyril, refused to complain. McDonough recovered enough to flatten Ritchie when he was about to make history for Bristol, but astonishingly, the ref saw nothing wrong. Nevertheless, it's a day Terry Cooper, City's player-manager, won't forget in a hurry. Tony Francis, ITN Sport, Meadow Lane. Cricket and England are fighting to save the first match of the New Zealand Tour against Auckland. In the second innings, they're 105 for four, only 42 runs ahead. On News at One tomorrow, we'll have a full report from Nigeria on the corruption in that country, which the new military leaders say they are determined to stamp out. That's a report from Nigeria on News at One tomorrow. Finally, the Prince and Princess of Wales are back in Liechtenstein for a skiing holiday. Prince Charles was at the controls of the aircraft when the royal couple flew into Switzerland before driving to Liechtenstein. Buckingham Palace is hoping that, unlike last year, the royal skiing won't be disrupted by photographers. Tomorrow, the palace has organised a special photo call, but they've appealed to the press to stay away after that. That's it from us tonight. Good night.